verse number five. He said, so with this, bringing in all diligence. I told you one, another translation said, gather all your strength and put it here. All your strength. So with this, bringing in all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. To knowledge, perseverance, but to perseverance, patience, but to patience, godliness, but to godliness, brotherly kindness, but to brotherly kindness, love. For why these are found with you and are bound, neither slothfulness nor unfruitfulness will stand against you. Hey! Neither slothfulness nor unfruitfulness will stand against you. Ha! Hey! He said they cannot stand against, they cannot stand against you. If you have these things, if they are found with you and are bound, then Ivy says, increasing measures. Verse 9. For he with whom these are not found is blind and seeth not. And had forgotten the purification of his former sins. He with whom these things are not found. Okay. So if we come to your life. And we don't find moral excellence. He says. You are blind. And you see it not. And you have forgotten that you have been cleansed. You have been purified from your sins. You have forgotten. That's why you lack moral excellence. Because if you remember that you have been cleansed from your sins. You will possess moral excellence. It will make you live straight. But when you forget who you are, you live like anybody else. They have girlfriends, you have girlfriends. They have boyfriends, you have boyfriends. There's no difference between you and them. A guy is dating seven boys, seven girls. and you're dating Seven boys, yeah. Some guys also say date seven boys too. All of it are part of the mess. Don't you know? Some guys say date seven boys. a man and he's dating seven boys. Say, this is my, that one has disease. So, he said, if these things are found, are found with you. But here he said, if they are not found with you. For he with whom these are not found. With whom these are not found. So, anywhere you show up, this quality should be found in you. They should be found with you. They should always accompany you in your journey. Oh my. Somebody is getting this thing finally. Because this is how, you remember Paul said, they have made shipwreck of their faith. This is how people make shipwreck of their faith. Because they, 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 they discard these things. And he said, it is because they have forgotten that they've been cleansed, purified from their sins. Because they have forgotten it. So they're no longer, they're, these things are not found with them. And he said the reason for that is short-sightedness, blindness, spiritual blindness, and short-sightedness. A man is not looking far into the future. He's not seeing far. He's not like thinking about heaven. He's not thinking about meeting Jesus Christ. He's not thinking about his life. When he meets the master, will he look upon you with a smile? Will he smile at you? They're not, they're not thinking that. They're short-sighted. They are just about, you know, present gratification. I, I, I really want to do this now. I really want this now. And they're going to have their way. They're not thinking about the master. They're short-sighted. I thought we were believers. I thought we were supposed to live for Jesus. We are supposed to live to, to please the man. Who gave up his very life for us. Paul the apostle says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we reckon that if he died for all, then are we all dead. And those of us that have died, he said we no longer live unto ourselves, but unto him who loved us and gave himself for us. So we're not living to please the man. No longer to please ourselves. We're living to please the master. He has become all that trees our soul. The only thing that trees our my soul is Jesus. My whole life is about pleasing him. It's not about competing with my friends. It's not about making my friends happy. Peer pressure had died. We're not interested in what they think about us anymore. 
We're interested in pleasing the master. Amen. Can I get somebody to give me a strong amen? Yeah. Yeah. Go back to King James. Somebody is getting this thing today. You are getting it. We're too big for the devil. Can I get a strong amen? Yeah. Struggling with, struggling with mundane things. Mundane sin. Mundane things. Things that we have defeated. Paul the apostle said, do not yield your members to sin. Do not yield. That means you have control over your members. Yes. So your members don't control you anymore. He says, sin shall not lord it over you. Why? Sin has been conquered. You are greater than sin. Yes. So how come it's ruling over you? Do you know what righteousness means? The Lord said to me, the message you guys be and you preach, if you cannot stop a man from sinning, then it means I have to go back to the cross because I didn't do a perfect job. I said, God forbid. He said, that's the implication. He said, what Adam did made men sinners. What I did makes men righteous. Not just righteous on the inside, but it propels them to live righteously. It makes them live righteously above sin. They see sin and they walk away because they are too big, too holy, too righteous. This is why the apostles walked to, to, to you know, they, they said, we're going to kill you. Say, let's go. Uh, where is the death? Are you getting what I'm saying? That's when they wanted to die. When they wanted. When they wanted, they went and they took Paul. He said, let's go. My job is done. I've finished my course. I've run my race. My time is up. I'm ready to be poured out as a libation. As an offering. As a drink offering unto the Lord. So they said, oh, you're a Roman citizen. We're going to cut off your head. Uh, where do I put it? He put his head and they cut it off because he wanted it. Then he came to John the Beloved. They arrested him for preaching the gospel. He thinks I'm not a believer. Then when he goes, I say, oh boy, you know, uh, use wisdom. A man needs to stay alive. No, when you are done, you are done. John wasn't done yet. So they arrested John and took him to the infamous Roman em emperor. Um, what's his name? The Eclatus. And the Eclatus took him and told them, set up the fires. They brought out a big container, filled it with oil. Is there in church history? Filled it with oil. And the oil, they heated the oil, it started boiling. He said, now throw him in. And John was laughing. They threw me in. He said, yeah, throw him in. He said, all right. So they threw John in. And they fried him. When they felt he was done, the flames went out. John was just inside, just quiet. <laughs> when the flames were gone, I'm telling you the power of righteous living. God said to, God said to the king, Abimelech, he said, I saw the integrity of your heart. That's why I kept you. I preserved you. Integrity has the power of preservation. And when the flames went out, John got up. They don't put this in the history books, but I read another history before, um, um, What's his name? Six volume fall, rise and fall of the Roman Empire by, um, I forgot his name now. And he said that when that happened and John rose, that the Eclitus ran. I said, nobody puts this in the history books. That the Eclitus got up and ran. Said, take him away, take him away. He's not mortal. Those are his words. Take him away, he's not mortal. He's not a normal human being. You will live the God life. Yeah. I said you are living the God life. Yeah. Don't let the devil drag you to his level. You are bigger than him. You are, you, you, you are, you are, you are seated far above. Far above. I said far above. You know, as the Lord reveals this to me, I said, lying is really an insult on my personality. If I tell a lie, I'm insulting who I am. I'm, I'm saying to myself, I am a nobody. So I'll look you in the eye and I'll tell you the truth. Praise God. Now, let's go through this. I want, I want you to get this. Because 
you know, we've been, we've been, it's, it's okay, it's okay. We live under grace, it's okay. But grace is tougher and higher than the law. Grace is. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Except your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Some people, well, I preach that to mean that the Pharisees' righteousness was based on works and the one that Jesus is offering us is based on our belief in him, based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And he said to me, I was talking about the conduct of the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees had no righteousness. I was dealing with that. Because righteousness is in two ways in the scriptures, in the New Testament. Righteousness is the nature of God. For he had made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. You don't walk to become righteous. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. You haven't seen that. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. So there's a doing of righteousness. There's a being righteous and there's a doing of righteousness. I call it the practice of righteousness. There's a being righteous and there's a doing righteous. Being righteous, you have nothing to do with it. You are made righteous. Doing righteous. Look at it. Little children, let no man deceive you because you can be deceived. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. So you are righteous and you are not doing righteousness. You are not righteous. Because the righteousness of God in you propels you to do right. If you're not feeling the proportion, the proclivity to do right, then ask yourself, what righteousness do I have? What righteousness do I have? Christianity changes who we are. Changes even our conduct. If the way we lived as unbelievers, we came to Christ and we're still living that way, we should ask ourselves, are we truly saved? Have we met the Christ that changed the apostle of Paul, apostle Paul from a murderer to a saint? Have we met him? Have we met the man that changed the woman caught in the very act of adultery to somebody different? Have we met the, the man that Mary Magdalene encountered and stopped being a prostitute? Have we met that Jesus? Is he the one we met? Or we met the Jesus of our imagination? The Jesus we created by ourselves. Nobody meets Jesus and remains the same. 